I love that this is still our bumper during Father's Day because like immediately when I think of dads, I think of dad jokes. And this is far and above the cheesiest bumper we have ever made. And I love everything about it. <laughs> well, hey, we're continuing in our sermon series, Grace in Action, this morning. So if you haven't been with us, we've been taking the past few weeks to walk through the book of Ephesians. And this morning, we're going to look at chapter 5. And so if you've got your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and turn there this morning. And real quick before we dive into the Word, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Ephesians. So Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. And it's written about 30 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And he writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. And this is a church that Paul started on his second missionary journey. And a couple of years later, he actually returned to pastor that church for a few years. And so this was a church that Paul was not only very close with, but it was also a church that Paul was very familiar with its people and the culture that was surrounding this church. And when you talk about Ephesus' culture, it's a wild one. So Ephesus was this large commercial city full of wealth and influence. It was so big that it was second only to Rome. And as a port city, Ephesus was also this incredibly diverse city. And so you had all kinds of different languages, backgrounds, cultures, and religions that took place here. And they worshipped a chief goddess who was Artemis, who was the Roman goddess of war, of the hunt, but also the goddess of fertility. And so they worshipped Artemis for her fertility side. And so what they actually did is they began to normalize and celebrate all kinds of different types of sexual immorality. And a lot of the ways this showed up are things like male and female temple prostitutes, but they also held these large sexual festivals where they would celebrate every kind of sexual morality imaginable. And so this is the culture that surrounded the Ephesian church. And so this church faced a really big issue and challenge with living in direct opposition to the culture around them. And so Paul writes the book of Ephesians as a reminder to them of what their identity is through grace and how they're supposed to live that out. And so the first three weeks of Ephesians, we looked at this idea of identity that Paul talks about that we are saved by faith through grace, and it's done because of the, resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then he takes the latter half of the book, which we started with chapter four last week, to talk about how we live that out. And so this morning, we're picking up with chapter five, and so we're going to look at verses one through two to start out. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, as we start talking about Ephesians 5 this morning, it's very important for you to understand and remember that Ephesians is a letter. It's not originally a divided book. And so even though this is a new chapter, this is actually a continued thought of what Paul starts talking about in the chapter before this. And so in the previous chapter, Paul is talking again about our identity and how we live out of that. And so he focuses on our role as members of the big C church overall and how we strive towards unity in Christ and maturity in faith. And overall, chapter four all comes back to this idea of holy living, of living a life that's worthy of your calling. And so as we pick up in Ephesians 5, Paul is again returning back to this idea, recalling what he wrote in the chapter before this and expanding on it in that morning. And so he starts off the same way with verse 1. He says, therefore, right, because of your identity, because you've been changed by Jesus, he says, now you live a different life. And so the way that we word this in the NIV is follow God's example. But there's actually a better translation for this. The word in the Greek is actually a little more direct and specific. Paul writes that we are to be imitators of God. And that changes things just a little bit, doesn't it? Because when you think about imitating something, it requires a deep study of whatever you're imitating. And so you have to know the very depths that make something what it is. Now, one of my wife and I's favorite shows is a show called White Collar. Anybody ever seen it? Oh, thank you. There's a couple of people in this room. The rest of you, you're missing out. Please watch it. It is an awesome show, and it centers around this character named Neil Caffrey. And what he is, is he is an expert forger. He's the kind of guy who can create replicas of art and things like that to the point that nobody can distinguish it from the original ones. But at the beginning of the show, he gets caught by the FBI, and in order to commute his sentence and take some years off of it, he becomes a consultant for the FBI and helps him to catch other forgers and criminals that are involved in that kind of trade. And one of the things that I love about White Collar is that it shows this incredible, ridiculous attention to detail that Neil would put into his forgeries. 
And so you'd watch him put things like the tiniest of little stains or the types of fabric on a certain wine label or how he would use a period correct cadmium white in a painting. And so it's all these little intricacies that the average person wouldn't even think of. But because he did this, his forgeries were so good that they were as indistinguishable from the originals as humanly possible. And so Paul, when he talks about the idea that we are to imitate God, he's saying that this is the level and attention to detail that we're supposed to give towards living like Jesus. And so it's not enough for us to merely look at Jesus as a guideline for our life, but we're to strive to look like Jesus in every way possible down to every detail of our life. Now, the reality of that is that's impossible, but this is the care and attention that you're supposed to put into changing your patterns and ways of life in order to try to live like Jesus. And so the idea is that your faith, it should lead you to a deep desire to look more like Jesus, and that should change the way you live. But the reality is, is that this kind of change, it doesn't happen just by observation. When Paul writes that we're to be imitators, he says that we're supposed to imitate like dearly loved children. How many of you are parents in the room? How many of you have nieces, nephews, anything like that? They've been around little kids a little bit. Little kids are like sponges. You have to be so incredibly careful what you say and what you do around them. Because anybody that's been around a little kid knows that they watch and observe you like a hawk. They are paying close attention to everything you do. But not only do they watch you, they repeat it over and over. And so, but this is the way that children learn, right? Is that they watch and they learn, they deeply observe you, but then they're going to put it into practice. They're going to try exactly what they saw you do. But this is how they learn to live. And so Paul says that as we imitate God like children, that this is the same thing for us, that we don't just grow by our observation, but we grow by our application. Now, Nathan says it this way sometimes in his sermons. He'll say information plus application equals transformation. And the idea behind this is that if you want this fullness of life, this fullness of Christ that's talked about, a maturity of faith, that you have to act this out. It's not something that just happens over time. But the problem with this is, is that so often we think that this kind of change just magically happens in our life. But it doesn't work that way. See, the reality is, is that to sit and wait for change to happen in your life, it's a waste of the power you have through Jesus. And some of you know what this looks like already. Because maybe you've been here, and maybe you come to church every single Sunday. I mean, you are as consistent as consistent can be. And maybe you read your Bible every single day. I'm talking, you are just taken in the word. And so you've got all this information, you're learning all this stuff. And maybe you've even gotten some of these deep, exciting revelations that just, you just get so pumped up about. But then you don't apply any of it. And so you, you take these aha moments, these big revelations in your life, but you change nothing and expect the revelations to change you. But the problems in your marriage didn't disappear. The porn addiction didn't go away. The anger didn't subside. The impatience didn't turn to patience. And so you spent all this time with Jesus, all this time learning and observing God's word. But you didn't change anything. And so your life still looks the exact same as it did before. Listen, if you want a worthy life, you have to live worthy. That this change that you so desperately desire, it comes through not only hearing, but doing God's word. Listen to how James says this in chapter one of his book. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they do, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And so as he writes this, this concept is that the worst mistake that you can make today is that you study God's word and you study God's word and you study God's word and then you never apply it to your life. That James says this is like looking into a mirror and getting this picture perfect. I'm talking the clearest example of what your life could look like. You see everything fall into place, but then nothing changes because you never acted on it. And listen, don't mistake me for saying that hearing the word of God has no power. Understand that I recognize and will say the word of God has power. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that it is active, it is alive, it is sharper than any sword. But it's up to you what you do with that power. See, the question you have to ask yourself before we go any further into this message today is what are you doing with the power of God? Are you wasting it by just observing it? Or are you living out of it and letting it change you into the worthy life that you're called to? Because here's what I'll tell you. If you'll apply what you learn, God honors obedience. James says that when we respond to his word, he blesses it. And so what we have to realize is that the change, it comes by us responding, us changing our life in response to God's word. So the question becomes, okay, well, how do we live that out? How do we do this? Well, in verse two, Paul gives us kind of an overarching view that he's then going to explain later. And in verse two, he says that we are to live in love as a sacrifice for others like Jesus did. And so living sacrificially, it requires us to think less of ourselves and to serve others in humility, that we give our life up for others. Now, there's a tendency when you hear something like this, because I mean, think about a phrase like, live as a sacrifice like Jesus. Like you hear that, and there's this image that inevitably pops into your head of this massive sacrifice. And so we have this tendency to feel like our life is made for these big moments where we have to display this grand devotion to God. But that's not really the idea that Paul's trying to convey here. And you've got to think back to the original mission that we're given by Jesus. That in Matthew 28, as Jesus stands before his disciples after the resurrection, he gives them a commission to ministry. He says, go and make disciples. I mean, how simple is that? Well, it gets simpler. Because in the original Greek, the word go isn't even a verb. It's a participle. And so the better translation is actually as you're going. As you live your normal, everyday life, make disciples. And that simple mission is what Jesus said would change the world. So maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you don't have some grand purpose. Maybe you feel like there's just no calling on your life and so you may even feel irrelevant and unimportant to the plans and kingdom of God. But can I tell you something this morning? You have a great purpose. You have a great mission given to you by God that you are called to make disciples one person at a time. And so, yeah, for some people, this happens in grand ways. I won't deny that there are people that have huge mission fields, Paul being a great example of it. But more often than not, this idea of living sacrificially, of laying down our lives for others and making disciples, it happens in the everyday moments. And so if you want to live sacrificially, if you want to live out this mission that you're called to, it means that you have to make the choice every single day to serve others above yourself, to lay down your life and live sacrificially. And so there's some ways that are easy for you guys to do this. I would say one of the biggest things you can do is to serve. You know, we have opportunities for you guys to serve here. One of the biggest ways I'll challenge and encourage you is get involved with our local missions partners. 
You know, twice a month, we have an opportunity to serve the homeless with suppers and showers here at the church. It's an awesome ministry. Once a month, we have an opportunity where you guys can serve at-risk veterans downtown in, uh, in Houston. And we also have an opportunity for you guys to help serve and support young single moms through Two Lives Change, one of our other missions partners. But there's also ways you guys can serve here. I mean, we're always looking for new children's volunteers and people to serve in first-time guest ministry. I know that for me and Adam and Sean, we would love to help train more people to run slides and help with the audio. But we also, this gym, every single Sunday morning, we set it up and we tear it down and we need help with that. But living sacrificially, it's not just about serving. It's a big part of it. But living sacrificially also requires us to live in love. That we live out the love that God showed us. And so what this is going to look like is you putting your, or other people's needs before yours. It looks like learning to respond in gentleness and compassion rather than lashing out in anger. It looks like loving people who are hard to love. It means forgiving people who have hurt you. It means helping those in need. It means showing compassion to the people who are hurting. It means welcoming the people who are different, the people who are outcasts that nobody else wants. That you love them and serve them well. See, living sacrificially, when it's done right, it will change everything about you because it's living out of the power of God and it's learning to apply everything that you have learned and observed. But more than that, living sacrificially will change the people around you and it will change the world. And so the challenge is that you would live a life worthy of your calling. You would understand that this is where you find your purpose. This is where you find your mission. And so the overall challenge this morning is to live sacrificially and imitate God. All right, well, let's look at our next verses. So in this next section, Paul's going to make kind of a shift to get a little bit more specific in some ways that we live sacrificially. Starting with verse 3, he said, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person because such is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And so Paul makes this pretty big shift as he's been talking about living sacrificially here to now he's focusing on sexual immorality. And at first glance, this feels a little out of place, doesn't it, given what he's been talking about. But you also have to remember the context that Paul's writing in and who he's writing to. That the culture in Ephesus was deeply immersed into any kind of sexual immorality you could think of. If it can pop in your head, good shot it was happening around there. And so for Christians in Ephesus, this was not only the culture that they now had to fight against, it's the very culture they came from. And so Paul, he is making this clear distinction at this very beginning. He lists out these different ways that sexual immorality makes its way in. He says sexual morality, impurity, covetousness, which we translate as greed, but it actually deals with sexual coveting. And he talks about coarse joking and all these other things. And as Paul lists these out, this is not his way of trying to tell the Ephesians what's going on around them. Because the church in Ephesus is very well aware of what the culture around them looks like. He is reminding Christians that we don't get to circumvent the commands of God. And so faced with the culture that celebrates sexual freedom, Paul tells the church, he says, look, stand firm in your convictions and do not conform to the pressure of society. And so then he goes on to make this very, very distinct and clear statement. He says, anyone who is consumed in sexual immorality has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And Paul's not writing this to judge people or condemn certain groups of people. He's not saying this to condemn people who are struggling with sexual immorality. Paul's whole point behind this, he's saying, look, if you've truly been changed by Jesus, if this is your identity, you are now saved by grace through faith, then it will change the way that you live, that everything you did before, this old life you had, it's completely gone. And so you have to change 
everything about the way you live. And he reinforces this in the next, uh, next couple of verses, starting in verse 8. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. So live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Because it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Paul's making this point. He says, look, if you want to live a worthy life, you have to expose the sin in the world. And he says this happens in two ways. The first one is you need to expose the sin in your own life. And so one of the things that you have to start with, Paul says that you have to stop convincing yourself that your sin is okay to continue in. That you need to recognize that your sin causes death. And that you need to cling to the life that God gives you and not to the death of the world. And so what Paul urges you to do then is to confess your sins and repent before God. That we acknowledge our sin, recognize it's wrong, but then we turn away from our old ways. Turn away from the fruitless deeds that cause death. Now the second way that we expose sin is that the church needs to expose sin in the world. And this is talking about the big C church here, not just Kara City. But the idea here is that we have an obligation as the church to be a light and to a dark world. And so what that means for us is that we have to stand against the evil in this world. And so we can't just share the love of Jesus without sharing the truth of Jesus. And so this is what Paul is making clear for the church in Ephesus. He says, look, yes, love the people well, love this culture, live sacrificially, but take a clear stand against its morals, not just by your words, but by your actions. And Paul's message, it's still just as true today. You know, our culture, it is consumed with the ideas of sexuality and gender and personal freedom. And so our culture looks at you and says, man, just be who you want to be. Be who you are. But scripture tells you to be who God called you to be. And so there's this ongoing, increasing pressure on churches to conform to society and start condoning sin. But I will be just as clear with you now as Paul was in this letter. We do not stand on the words of man. We stand on the word of God. And so it is our job, our duty, our obligation to share the love of Jesus with a broken world, but to stand against the evil and show them what it looks like to live in the right ways. And if you've been here at Care City for any length of time, you've probably figured out pretty quickly that we have no problem talking about sin. We want you to know what is right and what is wrong, and we will gladly share opinions on that. But more than that, we want you to live in a way that's manner of your, um, worthy of your calling. Because here's the reality. If we're going to change the world, the world does not care about our words. But they watch your actions. And so more than us just sharing the love of Jesus, more than us speaking against sin, the world needs to see us live a life worthy of our calling. They need us to see what it looks like to be a light to a dark world. I love the way that famous author and pastor D.L. Moody put this. He said, man, the best way to show that a stick is crooked is not to argue about it or spend time denouncing it, but to lay a straight stick alongside it. That if you want to change the world, if you want to know what it looks like to defeat the sin in this world and show people how to live like Jesus, he says it's more than just your actions, that we take a stand against sin through word and action. And so my challenge to you with this is, yes, expose sin. We have to be willing to take a stand against it. But show the world what it looks like to live in the true freedom of Jesus because that's what will change the world.
All right, let's look at our next verses. Starting in verse 15, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's going to end this section that he's been writing on with a practical application of wisdom. And so he says, look, here's what you got to do. You got to live wisely that Paul understood that the road ahead for the Ephesian church was a rough one. It was a dark culture. It was a twisted and broken world. And so this was not going to be an easy journey for them. But Paul also understood that the church in Ephesus had a great opportunity to be the light in the darkness. And so what he writes to them here, he says, look, make the most of every moment. And what he's saying here, he says, look, there is no opportune time to live worthy of your calling. There will never be a moment in your life where you go, this is it, everybody's listening to me, I'm ready. But rather, that despite the evil in this world, that we seize every opportunity, every moment of our life as an opportunity to glorify Christ. And he's going to expand on this as he talks about, he says, look, don't drink wine and get drunk, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul's not writing this to say, I just don't drink too much, which is true. I mean, drunkenness is a sin. But Paul's whole point here is he's saying, look, don't waste your life. It's like you're chasing after things that are of the world. You're chasing after things that are contrary to the way that you're supposed to live. And so you're looking at things that make your life wild and untamed. And so he says, what you do in response to this then is that you worship God continually, that you live a disciplined and obedient life, that you give God thanks in all circumstances, that you thank him for the ways he has blessed you, but you also thank him for the ways that he has brought you through the hard times. And Paul says, look, if you do this, if you will do these things, that you are filled with the Spirit of God. And this is not Paul talking about the initial receiving of the Holy Spirit when you're saved, but this is a passive verb that he uses. And so it's implying that the filling of the Spirit, the filling with this power, it is a natural part of the process of living a worthy life. And so what Paul's saying is that as we worship God continually, as we live obediently, as we give him thanks in every circumstance, that we are filled more and more with the power of God through his spirit. And eventually this leads to a mature, active, confident faith. So don't look at the days ahead of you as a burden. Take every opportunity to glorify Christ. Yes, it's a dark world. It is a twisted culture out there. But you have the opportunity to be the light to darkness. So don't live as unwise, but live as wise. Be filled with the Spirit and change the world. Let's look at our next verses. Starting with verse 21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul is getting ready to kind of wrap up his little section here. And so as he's talked about this idea of a holy living, of worthy living, he talks through a, big, a couple of big topics, and then he's going to end with another area that Paul believes that this living sacrificially is incredibly important for us, and it's marriage. And so the first thing he does, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we're going to get this picture of identity here again. He says, look, we revere Christ because we're in Christ that we've seen his power and we've experienced in our own lives and we're changed as a result of that. And so if we are imitators of God, like we're called to be, that leads us to live in humility, which leads us to serve others. And Paul says, if you think that applies to everyday life, it applies tenfold to marriage. And so he's going to continue in the next verses. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now these verses, these three little verses, have been the cause of a lot of controversy in the church. But I think a lot of that 
can be solved just by understanding the context and the meaning behind when Paul writes this. So you've got to look at this as Paul begins to talk about marriage and look at it under the umbrella of this worthy living, this holy, sacrificial life that we're living. And so Paul says, if you want to know what a worthy marriage looks like, it's mutual submission. And so then he's going to start with wives first. He says, wives, you submit to your husbands in marriage, not because the man is more capable, but because this is how God designed marriage that he called the man to be the head of the house just as Christ is the head of the church. Now, wives, understand that your husband, he is not called to be an authoritative dictator over you. The word submit in the Greek is a word called hupotasso, and it actually has this idea behind it of differing military ranks. And so this is not, when you're talking about submitting, it's not this idea of superiority and inferiority. It's really an idea of different ranks and different roles. And so the point behind submission as the woman is that yes, you have autonomy. Yes, you have control in your life, but you defer it to your husband because that's submission in God. And so your husband should be the one who leads your life. He should be the one who shows you what it looks like to live a godly life. He should be the one who takes the lead in big decisions. He should ser serve you and love you well. And he deserves honor and respect because he is the head of the house. Now, Husbands, deflate that ego a little bit because here's your part in submission. You don't live as yourself anymore. Look at the next verses. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, that he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So here it is again, right? You see this mutual submission that Paul continues to come back to this idea of worthy living. And so he says, husbands, if you want to live as a husband worthy of the calling you have received, you have to give your life up for your wife. And this kind of statement, it would have been so controversial at that time. Because what Paul's saying, he says, look, if you're going to say you love your wife, the way you lead her and serve her has to back that up. But you also need to understand that back in his day, wives were treated almost like property. And so husbands had the right to beat, abuse, and even sometimes kill their wives for pretty much anything. And so culture expected wives to submit to their husband even further than Paul calls them to submit. But Paul flips this whole script on his head as he says, husbands, you have to live sacrificially. That you have to sacrifice and give your life up for your wife. And for Paul to say this would have been a shocking statement. But this idea of living sacrificially, it's not just that you would die for your wife. I hope you are willing to die for your wife but it's that you're willing to live for her. And so Paul goes on to use this imagery of the radiant church. He says, present her as holy, unblemished. Take care of your wife as if she is your own body. And so all this points back to this picture that a worthy husband is a picture of submission and service, that he is humble and involved. So husbands, if you wanna know what it looks like to love your wife, in a worthy manner of your calling. I have two tips for you this morning. The first one is lead with humility. As the husband, you were called to be the head of your house, but that is not a position to take for granted or to be exploited, and it is not to be an authoritative position. You are to look to your wife's interests before your own. You lead her by serving her, not dominating your marriage. 
and you recognize that she is not inferior to you, but rather you elevate her above yourself as your partner in life. And you live out of this humility that you love and serve her and take care of her before you even think of yourself. But the second part of this is that not only are you a humble husband, but you need to be an active husband, not a passive husband. Now, I have a quick little joke for you this morning. It's one of my favorites. And it's less of a joke and more of a warning towards wives. Uh, Wives, if your husband says he'll fix something, he'll fix it. You do not have to remind him every six months. But there's this idea in society that husbands are kind of lazy and uninvolved. And I'll be honest with you, in a lot of ways, that is a very well-earned and deserved title on our part. And that's all fun and games when you're talking about leaky faucets or leaving the toilet seat up or not taking out the garbage. But men... Nobody should ever be able to say that about how you lead your family. You are the leader. You are the head of the house. And you need to take that role as leader seriously. That if you want to live worthy of this calling, you have to be a humble, involved, active husband. And so... It's not really that important. It's, it's good that you put a roof over their heads. And I'm not saying it's bad to save up and, and you know, invest in a 401k to protect your future and, and get ready for retirement. But I'll be honest with you, God doesn't really care how well you lead your joint bank account. He does care how well you lead and disciple your family. So the question to ask yourself is, are you leading and discipling your family towards an active, growing relationship with Jesus. And if not, here's my challenge to you this morning. Man up. Be the husband and the leader and the provider that you were called to be. Take the position as spiritual leader of your family seriously. Take the role as provider and protector of your family seriously. Lead in humility. Be active in your family. Don't take the back seat to the spiritual development of your your family. But be at the forefront of leading them to serve and love and grow with Jesus in every aspect of their life. Because that's living worthy of the calling. It's laying down your life and leading in submission and service towards your wife and your family. So if you want God to grow and work in your marriage... You have to love worthy of your calling. That you lead in humility and active service and let your actions and attitudes flow from that. Yeah, this whole chapter really is summed up the same way as last week. You have to ask yourself the question, are you going to live worthy of your calling? Do you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus? Do you want to find the purpose in your life? Do you want God to bless your relationships and to work and grow your marriage? Do you want to change the world? All of that happens by living a life worthy of your calling. I want to end with a quote this morning. It's from the famous pastor and author Oswald Chambers, He said, there's actually only one thing you can dedicate to God, and that is your right to yourself. That if you will give God your right to yourself, he will make you a holy experiment. And his experiments always succeed. If you want a worthy life, you have to live worthy. And it won't be easy. You will have to sacrifice in your faith walk, in your relationships, in your marriage, and how you respond to this culture, every aspect of your life has to be laid down at the feet of Jesus. But here's what I'll tell you. It's worth it. It's worth it to watch the ways that God will radically change your life. So the question for you as we end today is the same question as last week. 
will you do it? Will you live worthy of your calling and let God change your life? Let's pray.